Good evening, listeners, brave navigators of the enigmatic and the concealed. Have you ever felt the pull of the unanswered, the allure of the mysteries that shroud our existence? For more than a decade, a unique comic publisher has dared to dive into these mysteries, unafraid of the secrets they might uncover. This audacious entity is Paranoid American. Welcome to the mystifying universe of the Paranoid American podcast. Launched in the year 2012, Paranoid American has been on a mission to decipher the encrypted secrets of our world. From the unnerving enigma of MK Ultra mind control to the clandestine assemblies of secret societies. From the awe-inspiring frontiers of forbidden technology to the arcane patterns of occult symbols in our very own pop culture. They have committed to unveiling the concealed realities that lie just beneath the surface. Join us as we navigate these intricate landscapes, decoding the hidden scripts of our society and challenging the accepted perceptions of reality. Folks, I've got a big problem on my hands. There's a company called Paranoid American making all these funny memes and comics. Now, I'm a fair guy. I believe in free speech uh, as long as it doesn't cross the line. And if these AI-generated memes dare to make fun of me, they're crossing the line. This is your expedition into the realm of the extraordinary, the secret, the shrouded. Come with us as we sift through the world's grand mysteries, question the standardized narratives, and brave the cryptic labyrinth of the concealed truth. So strap yourselves in, broaden your horizons, and steel yourselves for a voyage into the enigmatic heart of the paranoid American podcast. Where each story, every image, every revelation brings us one step closer to the elusive truth. Every episode is special. This one's no different. Today we've got a name you might not know, Julius Freeman, but Julius Freeman has got some DNA all up in the Paranoid American universe. Uh, in fact, uh, I've, I've got it pulled up here, but he helped work on Time Samplers 2. That's Freeman right down there. And Time Samplers 3 that I've got pulled up. And we'll go over some of these pages and talk about what they mean to us. But yeah. Uh, Julius Freeman is an OG paranoid American. Uh, a lot of his thoughts have gone into the time sampler series that you've known to come and love. So we've got Julius uh, to talk about, you know, conspiracy theories and a couple other little comic projects. But we were also talking shop behind the scenes and we're going to get into some of that, too. I think it's interesting. So first of all, welcome aboard, man. Let me hold on. I got to put you back in the window. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for having Welcome me, man. Aboard, Appreciate uh, it. Julius Freeman. Tell people where they can find you right off the bat. Uh, you can find me on X uh, right there at that handle, a, a, a Lucid Comic. And you can also find me on YouTube at Julius Freeman Comics and Instagram, uh, a Lucid PRD. Uh, there are all just, I just pretty much promote and market my comic book work and, and stuff there. And um, yeah, just hustling, man. Hustling every day. Get my name out there. And we'll we'll get into some more of the comic specifics and projects he got going on. But I wanted to first let's just get into some conspiracy theories right off the bat. Because I think that's it. what a lot of people are here for. Yeah, and of course. When we linked up, it wasn't like I was just uh throwing rocks and trying to see who I could hit that was interested. Like I was trying to find somebody that already knew the conspiracy theories and that like I wouldn't have to bridge that gap first and then also find someone that was a good writer. So I found right. your work. It like clicked with me. And then we started talking and like you were telling me backgrounds on conspiracy theories. So I, I kind of knew that we were on the same level at that point. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it, what, was, it was cool. What age were you when you started thinking about conspiracy theories or giving them attention? Oh man. You know, dude, I was the seed. The seed of it was a, a little brief moment in when I was in um, a senior in high school. And I was boarding class um, in my video production class. We were, it was like during the low period towards the end of the year. And, um, you know, we're all hanging around. My, 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 my teacher, Mr. Bush was, was just, yeah, hey, just, you know, browse the internet, whatever, you know, it's the last few week before your, your, you know, your activities senior activities and whatnot. And what years is this? Uh, 99. Okay. So I'm like there fidgeting with my dollar bill and I just started looking at finally started paying attention to the back of the dollar bill and I was like you know why what is this pyramid with the eye thing here 
you know, I, I always seen it, but I never really, you know, you don't question it. You just accept it. Right. So, but that very moment, I was like, what is this? And I, it, and I walked up to my teacher and Mr. Bush, um, I always, I'm, I'm curious, what is this pyramid with the eye thing here? What does this represent? Is this like something Egyptian? And, and I'll never forget the look on his face. <laughs> he had this look on his face like, oh no. <laughs> He was like, oh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, the founders were were really big into ancient Egypt and, um, you know, just decided to put in the back of the dollar bill. And I was like, <laughs> oh, OK. And I accepted it. Right. I was like, all right, whatever. You know, I don't care. <clears throat> but it always stuck in, in the back of my mind. I was like, that's still not really satisfying answer. But whatever. You know, I'm, I'm a 17 year old kid. Um, I don't really care about that stuff. And it wasn't until fast forward, um, probably 2003, four ish. Um, I'm working at a telecommunication company, a store, uh, and there's a sign troller that they hired to, you know, stand in the corner of the sign. His name was Tim. A flipper and, or just a shower? Huh? You doing like, like the acrobatics and like doing the, the sign no, he was flipping. just standing. He was just, he just in the corner. Just like, you know, Hey, here's our store over here. Right. Okay. And, um, I was at my lunch break and I was reading, um, the Thomas Jefferson letters. As a, as a book, you know, I, I was really into reading a lot of American history and I really want to know what the founding fathers wrote. You know, I was curious because I never I had never read them. So I was reading it there and he was like looking, he looked over at me. This is tall, white dude, probably six or four. He's a big dude, actually. Now I remember. And he's like, oh, interesting. So are, are you uh, he, he just asked me, are you studying for that? And like, no, no, I'm just reading it for fun. Like, just because I wanted to learn. He's like, oh, interesting. Wow. So you're you're just uh, looking for knowledge and what now? It's like, yeah, yeah, you know. And then he just throws it at me, uh, Thomas. He just goes, did you know money is fake? <laughs> and I was like, what? He's like, yeah, did you know money is fake? And this is a stranger. Oh. This was a, 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 we were acquaintances at that point. I was like, hey, hello, okay. Tim. You know, how's it going? You know, that kind of deal. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? And then that's when he's like, well, do you have any bills on you right now? I was like, yeah, I have a 10. You know, I pulled it out. And he's like, look at that. Look, read that little message there in the front. And the message was this, this, uh, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Mm. Right. So I was like, oh, what does that mean? And he's like, that's essentially not, you know, and then that was it, man. <laughs> the door opened <laughs> after that every day during our lunch, he would sit me down and he would start, he started educating me on the federal reserve on like, uh, the, the, the creature, uh, was it the creature on Dick creature the, from Jekyll Island by, uh, creature from Dick, um, uh, yeah, Jekyll Mullins, Island. And then in secret society, all that stuff. And then that was it. I, I, I was and is like, this cooked. still 17. No, no, I was probably 22, 23 at this point. Okay. 22, 23 reading a uh, creature from Jekyll Island. That's a nice head start. Well, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and after that, I was like, you know, skull and bones, Freemasons, uh, Rosicrucians and all this stuff. Right. So I go way deep into it. The, the whole deal, right? New World Order, all this stuff, MK Ultra, And um, he and I are just talking. He's, he's, he's providing me more info, more info. And then eventually he got to the point where he got let go and I lost track. I lost contact with him and I just kept on going after that. And that's ever since then, I, I was really knee deep into it up until I read the Franklin cover up. And that, that's the book that kind of, I don't want to say broke me, but it, it led to, it, it led to a depression. If I, if I guess for lack of a better term, because that was the first time I ever read anything dark like that, that, that was kind of connected to this overall broad. I think that you know, might've been my first topic. one too. And this is a uh, John yeah. Dick Camp, former Senator. No, no, no. This was a different book. It was written by a journalist. Oh, Nick, I Nick Bryant's is the Franklin yes. scandal, which is the, thick, the Franklin. The thick thank one. you. The Franklin okay. scandal. Yeah. So yeah, that's so the what first, led to the me first reading that book is uh, John DeCamp. That's Franklin cover up. And then Nick Bryan, gotcha. I think like 10, 20 years later, writes the Franklin scandal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's what I read. The Franklin scandal. That's what, that's the one I read. And the reason why I read that was because um, I have found a, an old, uh, someone had posted a, the, an old documentary that was supposed to air on the discovery channel called the conspiracy of silence. Yeah, and I, found, I I watched it on YouTube. I was I watched it all, and I was like, "What the hell is this?" And then I started, and then I found the book, bought it, read it, and that's when I was like, "Whoa!" So 
say, whoa. <laughs> so, so that's what kind of, that's what led me to stop the, the research of these for a while, for maybe about a year or two. And then I got slowly got back into it because it was too, it was too much. And so have, now since, since that time, since it was probably around 2000 and maybe 18 is when I started getting slowly back into it. And then of course the, no, it's 2016, Pizzagate. So when the Pizzagate thing happened and I saw the, the, the straight up like sweep under the rug, you know, shock and awe media campaign after the, the WikiLeaks uh, dropped and Pizzagate became a, a, a part of our lexicon. Um, you know, it was like, it wasn't shocking for me because my, my wife, who I was dating at the time, was was she she couldn't believe it and it's like i just i just can't believe that they would have these things in pizza parlors that just doesn't make any sense to me and i was like well you know you i have this book here franklin scandal you can read it and it pretty much describes the same exact things except it's not a pizza parlor it was a i think it was a cafe right it was in the cafe uh there was a number of them a lot of them were just like these little underground rooms that were specifically right. made to do this it, it's basically right. if anyone that hasn't read the book if you've seen true detective it's kind of true go. detective yeah and so first three seasons not the last season yeah <laughs> yeah i haven't seen true detective because i i just i'm still Mm, I still have to like it's it's too it's still a little too much for me to to uh not comprehend but See, season uh, like seasons one two and three really like one has the premise of like the finders they kind of have this ah, group that's going around p- procuring things and there might be this right. tangential relation to like satanism or like an old pagan mm. worship so that's the first one and then the third season they actually have like the underground rooms with like castles and oh my god so it, it kind of oh show like each gosh. season focuses on one yeah. aspect of it because it's such a a complex story that doesn't make any sense if you just right. like right if, if it was an elevator pitch there's no elevator pitch in the world that you could start <laughs> someone off cold you know cold turkey and then get them sold on franklin scandal by the time the elevator's over they might report you that's probably right the yeah thing that'll happen, right? <laughs> yeah so these exactly. are like the, the even the franklin cover-up by the camp uh, even and I think Nick Bryant mentions this in f- some of his intros where like he's not sold really like he he read yeah. the book and he'd seen the interviews with Paul Bonacci and some of the other people that you know had made these claims and that he was like still on the fence but then he started doing like some deep digging and specifically looked into some guy named Rusty that was like an assistant to uh, who Hunter S. Thompson, I think. I don't want to yeah. speak too out of turn because it's been a while, yeah. but of course, essentially yeah, yeah, of course. he was like, Look, man, I came into this thinking it was all BS. And every time he felt like dug a little bit deeper, it was like, Whoa, maybe this isn't so crazy. Maybe there is something to this. And that's that's always been my approach too, where it was like, No, nah, I can't, it can't be like that. And then you dig right. more and you're like, Oh man, this is crazy. So then when something like Pizza Gate comes up, it's just like, oh yeah, that's it's just more confirmation of yes. what like has been laid out for 20, 30 plus years. Uh shout out to, to Dana uh rotting jewels, but she's also been peeling this back and showing how it's always been here. It's been here since yep. the sixties and before. Wild, man. Very wild stuff. But yeah, it's it's the realization. It's the realization of like this is real. This is a reality. And I understand the aspect of of like over exaggerating certain elements in order for people to just shut off because of course we we all typically naturally anyway um tend to shut off when something's too outrageous you know um but i've never i never i never shot away from entertaining ideas you know i was like well i'll look into it you know i'll look into myself making my own mind and a lot of the times when i do that it's it turns out like oh actually it's <laughs> it looks pretty it sounds pretty legit actually and i think no one else can convince me otherwise but going back to your to your question um yeah when we found each other you were you know i remember you you wanted to start writing your own comic books and you had this idea and it was a natural fit because you i i, I distinctly remember you educating me about it and i was like oh yeah i've heard of that Oh yeah, I read about that, and you're just—I just remember you going, "Oh my god, dude, you have no idea how easy my job is." Yeah, finally, anything to you. I had gotten down the the path so many times with a number of writers, and then it gets to it. It would always get to like one topic or another. I can never predict what it was, but there would be a topic, and then would just be like, "Oh, 
Like, I don't know if this is my thing anymore. You know what I mean? It would just kind of like beat her <laughs> off. And it was, and it was rough because again, like if, if you're shopping for artists or writers or anyone else to work with and they've never heard of Franklin scandal and you're just like, okay, here's the premise of the book. And then, you know, you can lose <laughs> someone immediately. So oh, you have yeah. to kind of like ease into it a little bit. And I did steer with the comics didn't go right into it. Started in like issue three or so, but uh, yeah, so that was a, a godsend to like find someone that was kind of already had navigated yeah. all that. You had gone all down the depression hole and come back out yeah. of it already. So <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, that was a huge plus. But yeah, sorry you had to go through that. That's probably a normal reaction to getting deep I, I, into the Franklin scandal. Yeah, I think most uh, you know, quote unquote, truth seekers or conspiracy theorists, whatever you want to call them, go through that kind of depression you know um a uh, period when they go deep into the reality of these situations you know uh, rituals and and you know uh underground um theaters right that that like you think you're entering a small little compact room and then you turn the corner and boom you're inside this freaking hallway like this almost like an amphitheater size you know uh, uh stage and who knows what what else what god god knows what what goes on in those places but um, yeah, like like I said, it was a natural fit and we got right to work and it was it was right up my alley because at that point, and I still do to this very day, I, I like to weave all of my research that I've learned over the years into the stories that I develop and write, be it, you know, if it's like, for instance, Research Protocol does have a lot of those elements in this uh, sci-fi story and my other projects like The Good Old Dragon and even Vigilant Fury. Um, has a lot some of those elements uh, weaved in there very subtly though not not in your face because I like to I like to have those things uh, subtly mentioned um, amongst the uh, the plot of whatever I write. Yeah, I, I noticed that for sure, and a lot of your other works like it's got the the nods to some of the same like motifs and themes without necessarily saying like this is this thing that you've heard of. It just kind of weaves right. itself in. Um, and you were saying earlier too, where we were talking about how hard it is to go from like zero to 60 in this. Yeah. I think that the Epstein scandal helped a lot oh. because now you can be like, it's like that. You know what I mean? Yep. So now yep. if you need to just describe the Franklin scandal, at least my view on it, it's almost like Epstein got all the top scientists and all the Hollywood stars, you know, like he, right. he was like the Hollywood version, but there's still other versions that just target like the heads of, you know, regional banks and the the heads right. that own, you know, seven or eight hotels, maybe not like seven or 800 hotels, but mm -hmm. the, like that exact same level, like those dudes got money to spend. They also want to do some like really crazy stuff in underground chambers. So there's a market for that. You know what I mean? And that's kind yeah, of, fortunately. And, and once that market's established the same sort of, I guess, trade lines and rat lines and like there's a like a new mm -hmm. silk road like a really horrible version of it that you know kind of erupts so it probably uses the exact same infrastructure for all the different classes of people that partake in whatever you know Absolutely. pizza gate or spirit cooking or all of this so this will this will be a fun episode i wonder who's going to sponsor this one <laughs> yeah <I know. laughs> yeah cool definitely was right the uh, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You pizza? Definitely We've deep. got the freshest ingredients. <laughs> oh, oh, oh man. Uh, but you're right though. Epstein was definitely the uh the culprit that made it mainstream. And I was really surprised actually when he got found guilty. Um, you know, when he got arrested. I I thought he was gonna get off. I thought it was no, oh, he's gonna give him house arrest and you know, he'll be he'll be let go, you know, because I at that I point think I was, the jig was up, man. Not, he was attracting national attention and they use it as like, okay, now like let everyone purge and get all the hate out on this scapegoat. So it, yeah. it feels normal. Otherwise, if he didn't go down, then it, it would have seemed like he was way more powerful and it probably would have just kept that, attracting more attention. That's what I was thinking too. And, but I found it very interesting too, in the timing of his quote unquote, you know, uh, suicide, um, how right when that story was about to hit fever pitch in the, in the, you know, hearts and minds of, of many, you know, uh, not just Americans, but people worldwide, you know, COVID happened and complete shutdown, <laughs> complete shutdown of all of everything. And I thought Tiger it was King very interesting. Over. Huh? Tiger King takes over. 
There you go. <laughs> the Tiger King takes over. Exactly. And and then it kind of went on the wayside until probably recently, we just recent again because of, of uh, um, who was it? It was uh, G- G- uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, right? Maxwell's uh, trial brought it back to the attention. But yeah, interesting stuff, man. This is crazy. We'll get her out. We're going to we've still got the free Ghislaine campaign going on. We're going oh, <laughs> to. Sure, yeah, we're going to make sure that everyone knows that she's innocent. <laughs> Wait, you serious or are you joking? I don't know. It's it's hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> she, nice. I mean, she was doing a lot for the oceans. She was trying to clean up the oceans. And there's a really yeah, she was. convincing argument that they might have some kind of submarine that can take them to, you know, if, if you've got underground rooms, who's to say that you wouldn't have like an undersea room or something? I don't know. I I know that one sounds a little bit out there, but that was one of her main focuses. Her focus was... Uh, had to do with like cleaning up the sea and she was the head. I mean, that could have all just been smoke and mirror philanthropy. Like a lot of it is, but it also means that she was in proximity to the people, you know, that have the resources on this planet, you know, not just in like some small room somewhere, like the richest people on the planet. She had the access to that had those fancy toys that can take them all the way down and not the little PlayStation controller, you know, Titanic (laughs) scuba things that implode. (laughs) Like she's got the real ones that no one cheaps out on. So I don't know, man, I I feel like, yeah, we need to get her out of jail. Well, I I would hope she would have access to all that stuff considering that she's the daughter of, you know, Maxwell, the the Maxwell uh, dynasty and from Britain. So I would imagine she would have all those connections. It's nice little toys. So I wonder who they're going to now, because I doubt that the uh, like the whole market just shuts down because Epstein's out. Right. So it's almost like there's got to be a number two out there that when Epstein went down, he was like, yes, finally, like I get promoted. I get (laughs) I get to be the guy. You know what I mean? There has to be people uh, like this. It's probably like a whole straight up like mafia organization where they've got capos and they've got like under lieutenants. And I don't know all I haven't watched the Sopranos recently, but all the different hierarchy of all that has got to exist in all these different operations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, in my research, I'm sure you know about this. Um, That's how the mob was created. The mob was created by an Italian Freemason. I forget his name, but um, he was really close friends with um, Oh, gosh. Um, Albert Pike. They used to send letters to each other. Well, well, maybe. I don't I don't I know who you're talking about. You're talking about um, Giuseppe Mazzini. And one of the claims is that mafia stands for Mazzini authorizes like arson (laughs) killings and all (laughs) this stuff. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, okay, so here's my approach on and the Albert Pike thing. My approach is, you know, I'm I'm a Freemason, self-admitted Freemason, Scottish, right? So. A lot of the time, whenever Albert Pike comes up, it's like, oh, you're just being an apologist for Albert Pike because, you know, you guys both worship the same devil or whatever (laughs) the explanation is. Right. Here's here's my take on it. Like I find, for example, Aleister Crowley, incredibly fascinating person. I don't follow Aleister Crowley because he was a dick. Uh, So sort of similar to Albert Pike. I kind of find Albert Pike to be an incredibly interesting person. But I also think he was a dick and I probably wouldn't, you know, hang out and have a beer with them unless I was trying to understand, like, you know, the the secrets of the universe or something. But he, if he started talking bad about somebody, I'd be like, hey, that's not cool, dude. You know, I like to think that at least in the in the times. Right. right? And I'm not equating Pike to Alistair Crowley, but it's not like I'm all of a sudden uh, like in Thalema or OTO or even if I was, I don't even think that means that you like. So anyways, anytime that Albert Pike comes up. That's the accusation. But like, if he's a dick, I'll call him a dick. He's a dick. Albert Pike was a dick. He was a racist. Uh, he was tangential to the KKK and more than one was. different ways. Like none of that is BS. But he also uh, acted on behalf of many different Native American tribes and like was their lawyer against the United States government in hmm. many different court cases. So he's sort of a, like a folk hero among Native Americans but sort of an enemy of black people because he also said that he didn't want black people in masonry, that if the, if masonry started allowing black people, then he would leave masonry kind of like a, like a racist Atlas shrugged of masonry. Although in later on in his life, he recanted that. And he said that he thought the Prince hall Freemasonry was like valid Scottish, right? 
and that he thought that they could combine, but it was, it's complicated, but, um, so he's a dick. He's a racist. KKK, like, you know, screw Albert Pike. If that's what you need to hear, but at the I, same I'm, time, go ahead. Uh-huh. No, no, I was going to ask, like, uh, if he was a racist, like you say he is, or he was, um, why defend yeah, the American Confederate general? So yeah, he was pretty <laughs> high on the. No, yeah, it, okay, that of course, yeah, of course that that would be the case. But why defend that Native Americans? Or is it just were well, Native Americans okay? Well, did he see them see them as uh, uh, <clears throat> as equal yeah, to him? He, or I, I don't understand. So, uh, so he was more interested in the history of Native Americans because he, I think, he became interested in the occult through his study of language. Um, mm. And then through his study of language, he gets introduced to all these Native American uh, sort of stories because they didn't really have a written story. It was like an oral tradition that got passed down. So he gets fascinated with that. And also because uh, like during his fighting, he would fight alongside some of the Native Americans. Uh, so like wow. and, he, and he would help Native Americans fight other Native Americans. So it wasn't just like anyone that's Native American is on right, board. Right. Like it was specific tribes that he was working with. Um, so that, and I think it was also partly because he was in, you know, South America, Mexico, uh, like South North America, you know, like Texas and below, like he went on these expeditions and hunting trips. So you're, you would kind of be screwed if you were relying on, you know, the natives and then also being dicks to them. I'm just, I'm thinking out loud here. I don't know. No, no, yeah, no, those those are, those are good, uh, uh, theories to hold there as to why he, he would, uh, it's, it's almost like. Like you know, oh, a, a person who bleeds with me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ride and die with this, with this person who bled with me, no matter what. So I think that might be the case and, where he's like, and the Native Americans own slaves too, you know. So they, that's right. They had yeah. a lot in common with them, you know. They, he was like, <laughs> oh, we've got, you know. So <laughs> oh, yeah, he's a, he's a horrible person, KKK, you know, all this. You know, why still be a Freemason? Well, he didn't invent Freemasonry, and he didn't invent Scottish Rite Masonry. He wrote right. a book called Morals and Dogma that helped standardize. Scottish Rite Freemasonry, but he didn't necessarily invent it. The English and the Italian dudes probably racist as hell too. They just didn't live in, you know, the United States. That all of that said, it was a really long introduction to it, but the letter that comes up so often about World War Three and all this and tying Albert Pike to uh Giuseppe Mazzini, I don't know if any of that's true, man. And I would I would a hundred percent claim that it was true if i thought it was because that's freaking fascinating that yeah. albert, if albert yeah. pike truly was talking to mazzini and they both were describing some oncoming like war out in the future that would be mind-blowing incredibly fascinating worthy of writing books and comics and documentaries and everything about yeah. and i'd be doing it but if you ever look beyond the one claim it seems like it's a letter that is related to leo taxel's um work and his work was basically making catholics and freemasons look bad now i'm i was also raised catholic so the fact that i'm catholic and freemason means that <laughs> take everything i say here with a grain of salt because i'm like the op the antithesis of leo taxel i guess uh, although leo taxel was like a french atheist and he just wanted to make catholics look silly and he wanted to make freemasons look silly so he writes mm. all these papers about Mazzini and and Albert Pike and that they're worshiping Satan and and he gets the Catholic Church all up in arms about it and like you know we hate Freemasons anyway yeah this is horrible and then he finally comes out and he's like haha just kidding you know I I did that now you both look like idiots but that was a hundred years ago and his work is still cited today in modern times as evidence because like the letter exists and the letter's old and it looks crumbly and it is from the 1800s so people are like oh well it's you know 200 years old and it's got to be see. true so i mean it's a real document but it was a real for it, it wasn't a forgery it was like uh like a spoof that he made and he admitted it and he said like haha you're an idiot you fell for it <laughs> but people still <laughs> cite it so so that letter is tangential to what leo taxel did but i don't know if anyone has like outright proven that he himself wrote it but that's the the strong implication so that's that's my look at it only because there's nothing out besides that letter uh, and the letter is cited in a book and that book relies heavily on all of Leo Taxel's uh, background. And it's likely that he was involved in the publishing of that, about that book too, because Leo Taxel was just a pseudonym. He had a bunch of them. So that's, that's the thought on it. I wish it was more. There's another one too, that Mazzini is the extension of the Bavarian Illuminati, but the the dates on that don't really line up 
well enough. There would have to be more interstitials between all of that. So hope, yeah, that, there's probably people in the comments that are like, you shill. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm all about, you know, clarification. So if, if you were able, you know, you, you pretty much explained it pretty well there. And I think that, uh, I think, I, I think you mentioned that in the previous episode that I watched, I forgot who was on that show with you, but you did explain that there. And I was like, Oh, I need to look into, that. I made a mental note. I need to look into that. See if, uh, and I didn't get a if, chance to do it, but now there's you, more you evidence that, again. that proves that like the, any of those letters were legit. Like I'm, completely open to it in fact i hope that that it is legit because that gives i mean it, it makes freemasonry seem like that much more mysterious like damn dude they you know they're on it again like they already <laughs> called out the whole world war and this mazzini link it would be re- it would be groundbreaking though because people have been trying to make this like a valid connection like historians are nerding out over it and you know, I, I don't want to not an appeal to authority here, but I feel like someone would have like the Freemasons themselves would have been like, hell, yeah, we're claiming Mazzini. Like, why wouldn't we claim Mazzini? But wouldn't there be some kind of like uh, you protect your own type of deal with when it comes to Freemasonry? You protect your own or, or a little bit. But who's protecting Mazzini now? Like the dude's dead. Like, I don't think that he's coming. That's back true. To yeah, I mean, that, that is true. But, um, but see, Mazzini, uh, you know, if you if you look at the implications of that, of what Mazzini wrote, uh, it started the mafia, essentially, the, the, the criminal organization that pretty much now is part of our pop culture and it's part of like a yeah you're, you're not wrong about that it, it was definitely linked to that and there was definitely a link to freemasonry because the p2 lodge um propaganda do one like many of the members there were basically like homeboys with mazzini so there's a direct connection between corruption mm-hmm. in the catholic church corruption <laughs> in freemasonry and like italian mafia and mazzini like it, it all connects directly together so that's that's sort of not in dispute. It's just that like like the mafia was named after Mazzini. It's interesting. Like I like that theory, and I've yeah. heard I've heard it, yeah. and I even repeat it sometimes because it's it's like the most interesting version of it. But I, I don't know. I, I want I want something that's like meaty. That's like and here's definitive proof of that. Um, right outside right. of just like the Carbonari stuff. Right. Wow. What what else you got? We got M- Mazzini's a really good one, and Albert Pike. <laughs> I mentioned Jekyll from Creature Island. You said MK um, Ultra. Like, is was MK Ultra just as a like a subtopic under Franklin Scandal, or did you go no, off? No, no, that was some, that was a uh, that piqued my interest during uh, during an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Actually, when it was the episode about that CIA agent who jumped out the window when he drank a cup of that was laced with LSD during the um um yeah I guess the MK Ultra program that they wanted to test right. it Frank, out. Frank Olson, uh I think it was nineteen fifty three, jumped off yeah. the Statler Hotel, which is now known as the New Yorker Hotel. Exactly. So that's what started that was was that episode going, what is the you know, I, I don't I don't think they mentioned MK Ultra. But when I looked into it and I started researching it, that's when I got MK Ultra. I was like, oh, okay, this is what this mind control program was. And it started off with, um, what was it? Um, uh, Artichoke? Was it MK Artichoke? What, it's it it's hard to trace all of them, but it, it probably right. started with uh, Project Chatter in the Navy, and then it turned into Project Bluebird, and then that ah. turned into Project uh, Artichoke, I believe. And then Artichoke turned into MK Ultra and then MK Delta and a whole bunch of right. Yeah. And it just went off. And- <laughs> the Artichoke story was interesting because I read a uh, uh I guess it was an, an article, I forgot which newspaper posted. I think it was the New York Times or the Washington Post. I can't remember which of the two newspapers did uh, printed it, but I guess um years later when they found when you know the that information started coming out to the public light because of the freedom information act um the artichoke the project artichoke was they they canned it because apparently one of the cia agents went to mexico to try out uh, psychedelic mushrooms because they they had found that uh i guess a, a a witch was living there and she had she rented her spot to like people who wanted to have it and, t- and use it yeah her, her name's uh maria sabina i believe and the agent okay. you're talking about was robert gordon wasson Man, you know what, dude? You you should be my uh, my reference guy whenever I have like I can't remember names and specifics. You know what's wild is I heard about Robert Gordon Wasson before I knew anything about conspiracy theories. 
uh, because he also, aside from finding magic mushrooms, he also found Salvia Divinorum. And when oh, I really? found Salvia, when I was like, I don't know, 14, and we look it up online, the only thing I could find on the entire internet were these old ass documents from like the 50s and 60s that Robert Gordon Wasson. And years later, when all this like conspiracy stuff kept coming yeah. up, I was like, where do I know that name from? And it was, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Like, this is the Salvia guy. Are you kidding me? So, yeah, that's crazy. Wow. Um, but yeah, I, I always thought it was fascinating that, you know, they, they, they canned it because he took, he, he tested him on himself and he, he had, I guess he, he dealt with a lot of, you know, that, that guilt he has, I guess. I don't know what kind of, I don't know what he did as a CIA agent, but apparently it all came crashing down on him and he went back to the CIA and says, yeah, this is not going to work with this. We got to do something else. We got to use something else than, than, uh, mushrooms. And and full disclosure, it's been years, so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, hopefully you don't get flagged, but, um, I also, I, I took some years ago when I was as a young man, I, I got a hold of some and I tried them and I was, what kind? And it really was, them? Uh, I got them from a friend, a friend of a friend, <laughs> you know, how that, you know, how that goes. his friend's name, sir. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just and so, you know, I, they say, Hey, you want to try? And I was like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Why not? Did you they know, have a they name? Did he tell you where they like golden coast, penis envy, albino? I don't Treasure know the Coast, name. B-plus. They didn't give me specific names, but they were they were the um yeah the it was like a yellow orange tip with the yep. white and the and the black underneath it. Yep, Nasty, terrible taste. Blue. Yes. Really? Yes. I don't. Think, I mean, they don't. I, I've heard they don't taste so bad. Uh, they're terrible. I, I I can't. I I have to drink it with orange juice in order for me to be able to chew it and all that stuff, but. Um, a great experience. I, I I don't recommend it, so I'm not uh, you know uh, saying that you should do I it. Recommend but it. I, it was great. It was amazing. <laughs> I don't recommend it. It was it was awesome. Well, I guess I I, I would I would advise I would strongly advise to do it if you're going to do it. Have someone sober with you, and you should be in a good place mentally. Because if you're not in a good place mentally, it could really really mess with your head. Just I say take it with your grandma. Go over to your grandma's house, have her like make you a nice little and just be like, Grandma, I'm gonna take mushrooms. Just take care of me. Sure thing, honey. Because you know she won't mess with you, bro. Your friends might mess with you. They might stick something in your ear and tell you that there's like oh my god. No, you know, thankfully and grandma won't it was it was a good friend of mine. She she took care of me, so it it was fine. It was you gotta have a good sitter. Having a good sitter is always good. Uh, good Exactly, exactly. Although it's also weird, though, especially if it's like a sober setter, because then you're like, uh, like, are you judging me right now? Am I acting weird? You know, and then it gets into your head. The best thing, which is very rare and you can't trust someone, especially the first time, but like an experienced sitter that's also partaking, but they're like doing less than you are or like they're Mm. doing, you know what I mean? So they're like on the same trip as you. But, you know, I don't know. It's 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 a perfect. It's like one of those Goldilocks scenarios. Like, how do you judge the right person and how? Anyways. Right. Well, no, <laughs> I, I, I knew this person for years. I knew awesome, her since but we're not advocating. Yeah, I knew her since we were teenagers. And so it was like, yeah, I, I trust you. I know you won't mess with me. And she, and she did it. She took like I said, she took really good care of me and my friend. We because he me and my friend did it together. And it was a, a crazy great experience. Was it just that one time? No, I did it a few times after that, but that, that first time, you know, it's that first time when you, you, you pretty much, you know, uh, take the virginity away of your brain, right. Of, of this. Of I mean, did this, it make like, you believe chemical. in God? Uh, it didn't make me believe in God. It, it, I would say it confirmed my belief of God. So I already had the belief, but this was kind of, I guess in some, in a weird way, solidified the belief how how so can you explain it at all did you hear a voice did you see something was it a feeling? no 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 i i did see something i saw i was i was uh during the peak we went to the park and we sat down on this bench i was feeling i was feeling pretty good and i'm looking at this at the surface of this table and i'm looking and i'm looking right and i'm looking around all the crevices and you know the the the, the holes were breathing right and then i see this little bug a uh, little green bug, maybe the size of uh, maybe like uh, no, no thicker than like a hair, a thin strand You're of hair. Aphid, probably. 
and I'm st- and I'm looking at it, right? I'm staring at this, so I'm like this, right? And I'm like staring at it, staring at it, and I zoom in, like my eyes zoom in on this bug, and it's and it becomes the size of a cat because I'm focused on this on this thing, and I'm like staring at it, and without saying anything in my mind, I say, "Open your wings," and the wings pop up. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> from the back it's like a, like a disney movie bro you can start yeah. commuting with nature <laughs> yeah. and he's he's it's there right it's this little green i don't even know what what kind of bug it was it was like a green bug and i'm staring at it and again i'm not talking i'm just staring i'm just in my head going now fly away and then pff, it, it flew away and my friend who was sitting there was going what are you looking at <laughs> what are you staring at because i guess to because to her she was like i was like like pretend the, the surface of my hand is the, the table. I was like this. You're like, yeah, all up on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it was actually the size of a cat because your like eyeball was like two inches. Exactly. And after that, I was I was like, whoa, that was that was intense. That was really intense. And well, um, that's that's a pretty common experience. A lot I know a lot of people are like, I can talk to my dog when I'm, when I'm <laughs> You're like, go, you know, go over there and sit down or like go lay in your bed or come over to me without saying it. Like almost I think almost everyone uh or so I hear that has gone through this it, a few times. It, like, it's it's one of those things, man. It's unexplainable and you just accept it and go, you know what? I experienced it. I know you may not believe me, but you know, it's, it's and it's the fact mine. that it's been illegal for so long means that there can't be any like research that's like, exactly. so what, what's your experiment about? It's like, oh, we just kept taking a bunch of mushrooms and seeing if we could talk to dogs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's not getting funded right now by any legitimate <laughs> outfits because it's illegal. But the second it becomes legal, like all of a sudden that becomes a real possibility. Now, now there will actually be an entire branch of studies over like, mushroom esp and animal communication right does that plant really know what i'm thinking you know what i mean (laughs) and even if it's frivolous at least the research would be out there so you could point to it and say you know empirical evidence says that it's no better than a 50 50 or if even if it's a 51 49 which is what blows my mind that means that there's enough Uh, or if whatever the margin of error is as long as you just come a little bit higher than that and it's like man there might be something to this and then all of a sudden People will be like, oh, yeah, it's common sense. You know, everyone knew about that. And it's like, well, yeah. wait a minute, you know, not <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, and part in the conspiracy part of my brain makes me wonder maybe part of the reason that keeping all of these drugs illegal is to prevent that type of research from being condoned and then spread out. Because if someone were to say mushrooms can make you talk to your dog, it, it completely changes everything we know, you know, oh, and that yeah. would. That wouldn't be the greatest thing. I mean, everyone that's inventing one of those little like dog to uh, English invention machines, like they'd be out of business overnight. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe that's the maybe that's the grand conspiracy about the uh, the, the uh, what do you call them? Cycle blend? Like, how do you pronounce that? The, I mean, there's uh, a I you know, there's a huh? million different uh, versions of what people call the different classifications of. Right. Them. That's right. That's right. You're right about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, it would be, it would be crazy. I mean, the, the, other, the, my, my other biggest takeaway was the fact that it does force, it does like put a mirror in front of you when you're, when you're on, on that drug. It like, it forces you to look at all of your shortcomings, your problems, your insecurities, and it makes you face and deal with it, which is something, which is, I guess part of me was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. But the other part of me was like, I'm not ready for this. Yet. <laughs> I'm not ready for this are you ever though is there ever a convenient time to face all of your Uh, all of your fears i i think there there is if you're looking for it and i definitely had that that own my own self seeking like introspective like uh journey that i had in my 20s where i had this like crisis um after a few things happened in my life uh personally where i was i did make the effort to you know look in the mirror and actually really like pay attention to who I was, who I am, what's my purpose here? What am I supposed to be doing? Why am I here? You know, that kind of deal. Like, why am I, why am I a jealous guy? Why am I so quick to anger when someone challenges my, you know, my, my beliefs or my ideas and that kind of stuff. It's very, um, it's, it was a very, uh, the first time I did it, I wasn't ready for it, but I think the last time I did it, I was ready for it finally. 
And so I, I did them by myself the last time I did them. I did them all alone and nobody with me. And I was in my, in my room. I locked myself in the room and I just laid in the dark while I was on it. And I said, screw it. I'm facing it, facing them now. And yeah, I, I have to admit it, it really did help me realize a lot of things about myself that I, I started working on from then on. And it, it's it actually has helped me become a better, I guess, person in a lot of ways. And even my wife, my wife would attest to that because the other day she was, she, um, I had written her like this, this little, I guess, long letter as to who I am at the time. That kind of, it was like a 10 page little letter that I wrote and she said she read it again. No, no, it was, it was, uh, I was, <laughs> no, I was sober. Okay. <laughs> but I've it heard was stories. I mean, some people go and they just write like, you know, oh, no, I, everyone I, they know. <laughs> I could not write. I could not write. I could not function when I'm on it. I, I have to like be laying down or sitting down or something. I can't, I can't do anything when I'm on that. But it was part of, part of the problems I had was communication as a, you know, communicating my, my feelings, my thoughts and all that stuff. I, I had a problem with that. And so when I was dating my wife, that was the main, I guess, issue of our relationship was the fact that I didn't convey to her how I felt about things. I just kept, I just kept them inside because I was, I've always been that way. And so I decided, you know what, I'll just write them out to you. How about that? And she accepted, she's like, okay, I'll take that. That's better than nothing. So I wrote her all the things that I felt about, you know, our relationship, what I want in life, my journey, all that stuff. And, um, you know, because like I said, a couple of nights ago, she's all oh, I found it. And I started reading it again. And I was like, oh, what'd you think from, you know, it's been, cause it's been 10 years now. And she's like, well, what do you, what, what do you think? Have I changed? Have I, am I the same? She's like, oh, you're mostly the same, but you have, you have grown, you have matured. Cause I've read a few parts of the letter and I was like, oh my God, you're, you're so, you're so arrogant, and egotistical, <laughs> like, of like your ideas of, of what you wanted to be and what you wanted to do. So after He's my like, second term of president, then I think maybe I'll dabble <laughs> in the tech like space. The, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> it was like, I want to be, I want to change the minds. I want to change the world with my writings and all that stuff. Right. Um, and she's like, but you have, you have grown where now you, you realize that you're more realistic. You're more grounded. You're more down to earth as you were back, you know, when I first met you, you were lost in the clouds as she used to tell me all the time. You're always lost in the clouds. She was tell me, you always like daydreaming about whatever it is you're daydreaming about. But yeah, I mean, that's, that was the last time I took him and I, and I, that's the one thing I will say was, I guess, beneficial. If there is, if there is, does come a time, you know, if it does become legal and they want research, that's my biggest takeaway. Um, the last time I took him was that I took him purely as a, not recreational, but I guess a, yeah, introspective spiritual, you know, um, um, journey when I, when I last took them and I haven't taken them since. I mean, I, I, and like all joking aside, I don't believe in recreational use period. Um, I think I can justify maybe like some <laughs> ongoing cannabis use or something where it's, it's right. not recreational. Like, Early on when it's novel, sure, it can be recreational and it can be like a thing to just do when you're bored and there's nothing else to do in like a crappy town. I get that part of it. So it might start that way, but uh, especially since the legalization and, and like all the medical research right. and like, how is it any different than any other mood stabilizing, especially done in in certain quantities, right? But any kind of recreational drug, like I don't think I've ever seen like a good experience in the long term happen from straight up recreational, I guess maybe X like nineties ecstasy style. That's kind yeah. of like a, like a club social drug. But even that ironically started as, you know, like a, like a military experiment um, that they would of give course. to you in the <laughs> clinical environment. And then it turned into like a relationship thing where they would fix relationships, not just between like males and females, but like hierarchical relationship issues. Ah, they would right. get that stuff sorted out. So it, it, it never really started as like a club thing, but it became a club thing. I think mostly because it was legal and you could buy it at gas stations for a while, but almost any That's drug right. out there, like when you said that, you know, like, when the last time you did mushrooms, you go into a room, lock the door, turn the lights yeah. off, like don't have anyone contact. In my opinion, that's the best way to do any of them essentially, because 
all, each one of those will face like force you to confront something in like a completely different way than you're used to. Even if it's mm-hmm. what like, I don't care what the substance is, uh, I would say do them all in like a, a closed dark room. You know what I mean? Like that's probably the ideal way for a lot of them. Absolutely. I, I agree. And, and I've come to realizations many times because uh, if, if I just lock myself in the room and just sit there and ponder and think and like really break down like the situation or the scenario, whatever the case may be, be it, you know, an issue with myself or an issue with a, with a friend or, or whatever the case. And um, yeah, that's it. Being alone. Silence is like the best, the best form of medicine. If you really are serious about becoming a better person, you know, I, that's just my opinion. But most people can't, most people who, in my opinion, who can't sit alone for five minutes, it's you definitely have issues you have to resolve because if you can't sit there by yourself with your thoughts, then you really got to get some work done. Well, this is also a huge red flag <laughs> as someone that's been uh, to AA and NA in my life. Uh, if you went and told anyone that was like not, I guess, on the, again, this is like we're on the same level on this, but if you went and talked to any normie and you're like, yeah, I kind of just prefer to do all my drugs at home by myself. You know, I prefer <laughs> to do all my drinking by myself in my apartment right. with the door closed and the lights off. They're like, whoa, dude, you know, you, you might be, you might have some issues that we need to report now, you know, <laughs> but because there's something that's like, oh, but if you do it out, like with friends and there's music and someone's dancing and laughing, okay, well, that's acceptable. You know, it was a social setting. But you take that same thing and you're like, no, I was just I was just by myself. You know, I wasn't doing any. I was just in a in a dark room just going through my head. And it's like, whoa, man, there's something wrong with you. I don't understand. Yeah. Like where <laughs> at what point? Like how many people do you need to be around? How like how light do the lights need to be until it's not creepy? What about right. a black light? What if what if there was a movie on? Does that make it acceptable? Like there's all these weird little things, but like the the far end is like you're alone by yourself in a dark room and on the other opposite end is you're at like a rave and everyone's going crazy and dancing like there is like a completely acceptable version of that rave one like oh everyone's been you know 20 before you know i remember right. my younger days but yeah. if you're like no i just like to go crazy you know by myself in a room i don't know it, it hits a little bit different for some people they don't understand it because they see drugs as recreational Exactly. And and a lot of them also are, are, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, extroverts too. So it, I, it's understandable that extroverts don't like to be introverted. They don't like to be alone. They don't like to have be alone with their silence and their thoughts because that's some, that's not just, that's not their jam, you know? And, and I'm the opposite. I'm not an extrovert. Like for instance, talking to you now on the show and not just this show, but any live stream, it, I I'm always really nervous before I go on, but I've been practicing, you know, little by little and just have to remind myself, I just have to be myself, just be myself and screw it. Like this is, this is the, this is the way it has to be. You know, I have to sell books. I have to promote, I have to put myself out there. So just go out there and just talk, you know, but for those of you who don't know, I, I guarantee, I, I promise you before I got on the show, I had to like prepare myself mentally to get on the show. Cause if I don't do that, it's a mess. I was like that for the first year or so when I was just going on to other people's shows and guesting the first, I don't know, 10 to 15 shows. Uh, I would have to take like a Xanax an hour before and like get everything <laughs> right. situated, like make sure that it was like working and all that. Right. Uh, like I was going to the airport or something. You know what I mean? Like that's the only other time that I usually take a Xanax is if I know I'm going to have to go through some like high stress scenario, but I don't anymore because now uh, like podcasts have turned into like my better version of TV or like it's the TV that I can talk back to yeah. and like ask questions of the show that I'm watching. So I, I understand a, a million percent exactly what you're talking yeah. about. And I, <laughs> I'm not going to say any names, but I mean, I, I've talked to some really large podcasters that are like 10, a hundred times the size of anything I've done. And they describe the exact same thing. Like it never goes away. Even, even after you've mm-hmm. been doing it for, you know, five years and you've got hundreds of thousands of subscribers and everything, like sometimes it just like you always get those butterflies. There's a lot of actors that say that too. Like every time yeah. and musicians, every time before they go on the stage, they just throw up. You know what I mean? It's just like yep. part of the the ritual at a certain point. Exactly. Exactly. And thankfully I, I I studied drama for a lot of years in college. And that was the one thing that I that was my biggest takeaway. Uh one instructor, forget his name, he 
he really put it in perspective for me, which is, which is when he said, I'm not here to, I'm not here to teach you how to, how to silence the butterflies. I'm here to teach you how to harness the butterflies in your stomach to use that as energy to put out into your character when you go on stage. And I was like, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. So now I still use those, those like warm up techniques before I go on podcasts or live streams, just so I won't, I won't go crazy. You know, what, what's one of those uh, techniques? How do you change the the butterfly and like, so, so like, you know, you get that feeling in your stomach, right? It's, you're getting nervous. You're, you're starting to sweat all that. And then you just, part of it is, is just, it's almost like jumping into a pool. You don't think about it or, or like jumping into the ocean. You first get there, don't dip your toes. You run in there and you jump in. So when we started the show, if you notice, we just went right in. You know, I was nervous. It's just, let's just go. Let's just start this, this conversation. And then now it's, it's starting to flow. And now I feel more comfortable. We're going back and forth. And that's, and, and you just gotta, it's almost like throwing the pebble in the, in the, in the uh, lake. And then the ripples come in your way and you just go with the ripple. You just go with the flow of the ripple. So, so it, a lot of part of this too is we were talking shop a little bit before recording, but this is like an inevitable need if you're doing po- comics of any kind, if you're writing or doing the artwork right. or the publishing or any aspect of it. At a certain point, it's like okay, you've you've worked on this comic, but if unless it was just for you and the other people that worked on it, you want to get other people to read it, and now it's like you got to go out into the world. Yep. And then it, it enters this completely different uh, freaking beast, man, where it's like, I love the creative process because I can herm it up and I can do research mm-hmm. and I can spend all this time and craft these worlds that don't exist because the outside world kind of sucks sometimes, right? Yeah. But then after you've <laughs> created this like perfect world or this interesting world in a book, now you got to go back out to that crappy version and like get people to be interested in it somehow. So there's... I don't know if it's a of line or if it's like a men, mental switch or what, but like this feeling of, oh man, now I'm like selling people crap. Like I'm just like a salesman <laughs> now. And it's, I, I've never been that. Like there was a point in my life when I straight up did, you know, like um door to door sales and like walking up to just strangers and like, Hey, I've got something to sell you. And so I like, I can force myself to do it, but man, it, it never feels good. It never yeah. feels right. It never comes right. naturally. It's always sort of like an act that gets put on and i don't i mean i'm 40 now i don't know if like it just magically falls into place over the next 10 years and i just become like a charismatic salesman it feels like that's somebody else's bag uh but like i struggle with this just as much as anyone does so like what do you do is there anything special that you do to like you know you find someone you're in an opportunity right and you're like oh i could bring up my comic right now or i could bring up the fact that i've got this kickstarter campaign that i want people to back like you know what is the mental process you go through i don't think there is a process to be honest with you <clears throat> it's just um you know I, when i worked at the the telecommunication company it was a cell phone company i don't want to give a name because uh is uh, just the one to put him on blast, but when whenever the managers mobile, or managers would try to it train me, mobile. huh? It was Boost Mobile. We know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure, sure, it's Boost Mobile. Um, whenever the store managers would try to train me to sell this product, uh, they, I just, it just didn't, you know, like like you just said, it didn't feel right. I felt like I was pertain i was being someone that i wasn't and i was like lying to them like i didn't really care for the product and that's what that's when one of the managers which is what led to me leaving the company because it, it made me realize yeah you know what i don't belong here i really don't belong here he 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 told me that's your problem right there you don't care you don't care about the product the key to being a good salesman is you have to care for the product you're selling and if you don't care for the product you're never going to sell anyone anything and that's when he told me, what are you doing here? Why are you here? If you don't want to do this. And I was like, well, I need the money. Don't you He's, love okay, the well, cell good. service that we sell? <laughs> Isn't this the greatest Well, no, I, I, I told him straight up. I was like, it? honestly, you guys pay good. You know, good. there's a good medical, medical coverage. I mean, I'm here because out of necessity. He's like, yeah, but you can find another job like this that pays you the same and gives you the same coverage. So what are you doing here? If you don't believe in the product you're selling. And then I was like, whoa, okay, well. 
you're right. And then after that, that's when I shifted to go away. So now I guess now that I'm thinking out loud, <clears throat> there, is, there really is no t- technique. It's just a matter of, I like what I wrote. I like what I produced. Here you go. Like, check it out. And if you like, for instance, like the reset protocol, if you like that, if you like a sci-fi, you know, fantasy, you know, parable, then you might like this book. Check it out. Here's the artwork. Here's the story. You know, uh, give it a look. And if you if it's something that you dig, you know, thank you for your support. If not, hey, it's all good. And here I've, right. I've got it pulled up since you're talking about it. This is the current comic that you've been working on for a while. Like I remember you sent yeah. me previews of this long yeah, time dude. ago. <laughs> yeah, um, seriously. So this is this is reset protocol. Yeah. So what's what's your pitch, man? This is the the thing that you've been pushing. So what's yeah, the, the reset protocol is a story about a cosmic voyager who arrives to a planet that is eligible for a seat in the Galactic Federation. And when he, upon landing on this advanced civilized uh, nation, you know, he requests, he has one request from the rulers of this nation, which is just give me one full day of full transparency. And based on what I observe, then I will either approve your, your eligibility to the seat or I will, you know, deny it. And then you could try again at an allocated time. And so they agree. But then he find he discovers that they're hiding a dark secret, you know. Uh, and once he discovers this dark secret, they imprison him and torment him, you know, trying to get, coerce him into uh, getting him to accept them. And uh, what they fail to realize is that this uh, the seeker is the name of the this cosmic voyager. He has the capability of doing what's known as the reset protocol, and he decides to. Uh, exercise that option as he has no other option but to use it and that's the essentially the pitch of the story and i'm i'm just looking at some of the images here and we've got is this like an underwater scene where there's like no 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 it, it's a, it's aerial it's just that the this was a color sample i i was testing out i was trying out different colorists and this is one sample i liked it but it wasn't exactly what i was looking for but i still like the colors so that's why i used it and added it there because I, I i liked it and i see like a big crystal shard here mm-hmm. is that is what's the the concept of this city here is it like runoff of crystals uh yeah that's the idea i don't dive too much into how the city functions it the story is really mainly about um the seekers pretty much observation of, of of this world and then finding the secret finding this dark secret that uh that they're trying to hide from him so they could get into uh, a seat in the galactic assembly. And how far out do you have this story in your head? So this is this is the first issue, or is this no, like no? A it's a novel? one shot. It's a okay, one shot comic. One shot. It's a one shot. It's a fifty plus fifty plus page one shot comic book, one and done. No issue two or three. Um, so this is it. This is the book. It's done. I only have about the. Uh, I, I'm right now, another artist is currently drawing six pages. That's for a sequence, a dream sequence um, within this book, but it's going to tie into the overall story. And once I have those pages, it's ready to go. It's ready to deliver on April, uh, this coming April. So that's the goal for me to uh, fulfill the, the books to the backers. And onward, onward we go. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to see that it's already like over two thirds of the way there. So, and you've got, I know, man, it's um, really exciting. A couple weeks like, to go. Yeah. A few more weeks. It's nerve wracking, man. Running one of these. It is. is absolutely nerve wracking. And it's yeah. also, it's like a, like a whole full-time job on top of it. Uh, it really in is. addition to like the real way to do it is that you run it. Like I've, I've had direct meetings with Indiegogo and Kickstarter and all of like the, the big, guys like you know actual like zoom meetings and stuff where they kind of mm. prep you for like a, the bigger campaigns and they all suggest a minimum of like a month to like like get people hyped about the campaign but usually they suggest three months so mm. in like the perfect world according to the, the crowdfunding campaign guys you have three months of hype and build up and promo and you've got the month of the actual campaign and then you've got the month of like the post campaign where you're posting updates and you're you're edging people to like sign up for the next one and all that so 
all things considered, that's a five month project. Right. That yeah. Takes a considerable amount. Like you're doing copywriting, you're doing like images and social media posts and all the different platforms. And not to mention all of like the actual production aspect of whatever yeah. the project <laughs> is you're doing also right. happens in those. It's, it's insane, man. And to, to do it like all solo or as like an indie project here, like who, like, are you running this particular Kickstarter? Yeah. yeah it's, it's all solo. It's also, awesome. this is, I, I this wish is like one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do is run one of these campaigns solo. And then Dude, it, it's, and- it, it's, um, I'm not going to say it's on par with the political campaign, but now I, I could see how, why it's called a campaign, why it's called a political campaign. Cause you have, because these politicians who are, you know, vying for your vote, they have to travel town to town, have to go, have to visit this radio DJ, this person, this person. Get your name out there. It's the same deal. You have to get your name out there, get your product out there, so people, more and more people, can know about it and want to want to get a copy of it. And um, and you've been doing well yourself, man. Like I've been, I've been keeping an eye on what you've been doing, and it's like, dude, you have a, you have an entire little store. I remember you you posted a video of of uh of like all the little little merch that you have in your wall. Uh, you have all it's organized growing, and everything. Man. Yeah, I was like, dude, that's so cr- that's so crazy that you have all this stuff ready to go whenever you know at a whim's notice if you need to like put it out and like deliver it to uh, backers or even people who who purchase straight from your website. So it, it it's, took a that, long, long time to get there, man. For the first ten I plus bet. years, it was all print on demand and using Indie Planet and all these other places where. Like you have to direct someone if they have a problem with it. It's just like I, right. I can't help you. That was the the number one reason, really, that. I started trying to do my own inventory and ship everything out is because there was ever a problem person that had an issue. All I could say is contact this printer, whatever. And it's like the last thing that someone wants to hear yeah, when they bought right. something from you is you're like, Oh, you know, not my problem. Go talk to this guy uh, and getting stuff, getting lost. So yeah, that's, it was, it's a huge uh, sort of like jump from that, but it's, it's worth every bit of it, I think. Cause then you get a chance to like write little, you know, handwritten notes or yeah. add little stickers yeah. and that stuff doesn't happen in these print on demand places. No, they don't. And also it, it also helps with uh, retaining your, your readers and your customers. They, they, now, now you have a loyal customer base that's going to always go to you because you, you always deliver, like you said, handwritten notes little messages. It's, it's a personal touch that I think a lot of uh, modern day readers and, and backers like, they like that because the, the corporate, you know, systems are kind of going away with that. They're not, they're no longer doing that anymore as I've, as I've come to notice. And so, I, I mean, I think now is the best time for us indie creatives to just find, create our own brand and just put it out there and see if people are willing to, uh, um, you know, uh, support us and and help us grow. I mean, I, I'm a big. I, I used to be a, a huge George Lucas fan, not because he created Star Wars and like made movies, but he owned Star Wars himself. He owned it. He owned Star Wars, not not 20th Century Fox, not a movie studio. He did, and he owned it for so many years until he sold it to Disney. And I was, and I always told myself, I want to be like that guy. I want to create something. And if something does blow up, it's, it's mine. I own it. I can do whatever I want with it. You know, if someone wants to license it out, make it into a movie. Great. What's the deal? What's the licensing deal then? You know, cause I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> you have to pay me to, for the privilege of, you know, uh, producing this into a movie or a TV show. Like I think time slampers for instance is, would be a great TV show. It would make a fantastic, not in, not a, not a live action, an animated TV show. It'd be freaking. I mean, that was, that Rockers. was the whole premise, man. And then honestly, when I don't know if I, I think I told some of this to you when we first started out, but before time samplers issue one even existed, it was supposed to be pitched as an animated series for like HD HBO or adult swim or nice. something. And I flew out with some of my really good friends, uh, shout out hope and Andy who, uh, who are family members with Eric Casonas, who was the other co-writer on some of these issues, but oh, we right. fly yeah. out there. And we talked to uh, Five Point Harness Studios, to Titmouse, uh, to a few different affiliated groups that worked with Adult Swim and even Film Roman right. and Klasky Supo, like all the wow. all the huge heavy hitters. Like my like I met 
you know, my my childhood idols that were working on Doug and Ariel Monsters and Simpsons and everything. Crazy. And we get yeah. out there and I actually have the chance to pitch all this. And like, I mean, I was 20 something, had no idea what the hell I was doing. Like the right. story wasn't <laughs> fully formed in my head. And legitimately, the initial version of time samplers was very heavy, uh, like Franklin scandal. Like it was very dark. Ah. Like, like the the first villain they were going to go against was this guy called the Pharaoh, who was basically like a like a badass version of um, Larry uh, King, Lawrence King. Right. Like oh, instead of being like okay. a pudgy that yeah. dude he was gonna be like <laughs> yeah, this rip, yeah, yeah. Like, scary dude you know and i got some advice directly from a couple really big names one of them was donna carey um who was a writer on the simpsons and writer for like snl i think he's got all kinds of shows and his feedback was like it needs to be funny like i like he understood the point right. of like trying to get this historical thing but it's he was also saying that as an animation specifically, if it was live action, maybe you can go gritty, but like even as an animation, you know, it, it, people are expecting it to be a little bit lighthearted, like a little bit funny and yeah. campy. And then just yeah. go like straight, like, like balls to the wall, Franklin scandal, Paul Bonacci, you know, <laughs> finder. it was, it would have been like a very tiny niche. And I remember asking, I was like, well, what about spawn? You know, like, cause spawn had a animated show and it was kind of like uh, this, this isn't spawn you know what i mean like yeah. and it wasn't um but yeah that that was that was a huge point where i kind of changed direction cuz i realized i was like you know you're you're kind of right at one part of me was like screw you man you just don't right. want me to like yeah. put the real truth out there but the more you think about it it's like yeah man like this might not be as easy to sell to someone and it might even turn people off and that was when it was like all right you know what instead of like being completely real let's have like literal sheeple and let's have time travel and let's have yeah. like all this crazy like all this stuff that is so off the board because that was the other bit of information that he gave me was that you know if if you were doing this as a movie and this this is a, what sticks with me forever and i use this always if you were directing a movie like if you wanted to have a huge spaceship come in and blow up the white house and like, you know, blue energy explosions and holograms all over the place. Even if you could do that in a movie, you're paying like a room full of animators to like figure all this stuff out. And like, you could write it though in a short story or book and then it's free or you can like draw it. And if you did it, like he was working on these little shorts and comic sketches, you could do those. And now like, you can have any idea in your mind and the budget's basically the same. Like if you have two people talking in an elevator for an entire page, or you have a, like a galactic war with like explosions going off roughly the same budget, you know? So why yeah. would you ever spend money to have people just talking in panels back and forth when they could be like, have an explode, like not every single page can have an explosion going on, right. but that was, that was huge. And that's the reason why time samplers is a little like campy and silly and off the wall like that, because the first version was just straight up an illustrated version of Franklin scandal. So, mm. you know, it, it wouldn't have, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it would have if been as popular. Um, well, that's what turned, that's what I liked about it. When you pitched it to me, I was like, Oh, I like this because it's, it has the heavy subject matter that, I, that I, that I know and I'm familiar with, but it also is lighthearted and fun which is a good combination to have when you write something like, you know, something heavy uh, with, with the heavy themes like uh, the Franklin scandal and the cover up. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, um, easy time samplers to shoehorn in anywhere. What was that? The Franklin scandal is not an easy topic to shoehorn in. To, oh like, no. Yeah. No way. Idea. <laughs> no so, way. So it kind of had to start from there and then get softened as opposed to like have something soft and then you inject something hard. And then it. you do it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which is the, always the best way to do it when you write any kind of story. But I, I remember it's funny. You mentioned that about the advice you, you were given because I remember reading, uh, not reading, watching a, an interview um, about the creation of Rick and Morty and how they got it greenlit by Adult Swim. And they were interviewing the, the producer who greenlit it, the one who said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm interested. Um, but he gave him a catch. He's like, but, I, but I, I, you got to change one thing, though, about it. And they're like, you know, both the Dan Harmon and um, uh, what's the other person's name? The, uh, the co-creator? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm searching my head. I, I know his name. It's where I tip my mouth. But Yeah, same thing. Same here. Uh, 
Argyle or whatever. Royland. Um, Justin Royland, I think. Justin Royland. There you go. Thank you. And, uh, you know, of course, like like you, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, it's perfect the way it is. Like, what, what, what do you want us to change? And he said, Morty has to stand up for himself. And they're like, what, what do you mean? He's like, he, he's too, he's pushed over. To, he's, like, he's a pushover. He's a complete pushover. And I like Morty. I like Morty. And I think he should, he should stand up for himself every so often or more often than, than, than not. And that was the deal. They're like, okay, fine, we'll do that. And then that was it. That was the uh well, they also compromise. took out the incest part because the original version yes. of that, <laughs> Thank God for that was molesting Morty. That was like the <laughs> joke, I thought. Yeah, that was like, no, thank God they got rid of that. Thank God they they yeah, that would have not been which is funny though, because that that like I guess the very original Rick and Morty pilot, that was the joke. That's what made that it was funny. the joke. It wasn't that they yeah. like went and did all this crazy stuff? It was just that. And I think the premise was literally, what if Doc from Back to the Future yeah. was molesting <laughs> Marty? And that's oh where you God. get Rick and Morty. And that was right. literally like Doc molesting Marty from Back to the Future turned into a joke. <laughs> but then, yeah, they were like, okay, A, he's got to stand up for himself, but also be like, you can't, you got to take out the incest, uh, yeah. like molesting yeah. part. And thankfully they did. Because uh, I don't think I would have liked the show if they had, if they had that. Well, they wouldn't have know. gotten Happy Meal toys. No, <laughs> that definitely would not have gotten that meal toys for sure. <laughs> oh man, but yeah, it it was fun to write time samplers. I had a great time doing it when you when you provided the the premise to me, and I liked the aspect of time traveling, but it was a mixture of like, uh, uh you know, in the machine, but they had to like uh, use things from the past, and also if I remember, if I'm remembering correctly, too, uh, they also did it also involve. Uh, hallucinogenic drugs too yeah although it's it yeah. steers away from that a little bit because over because time samplers is like over 10 years old now but like at right. the beginning on issues one and two there was a big emphasis that the wild machine which was the wake initiated lucid yes. dream machine they would like load it up with something like the first one it was salverin a and then there was a reference to like some other <laughs> blend of different strains and right. stuff of, of weed but as i kept writing that time samplers i realized I refer to it as like my kitchen sink comic, like the first three or four issues. It was like mm. every idea that I'd ever had in this right. one thing. And then over time it was like, okay, I want them to be more about the historical conspiracy theory stuff and maybe less about all the particulars on like how the wild machine works and all the psychedelics. And that birthed another series called secret mystery school where the focus on that was like psychedelics are the key to some sort of travel between dimensions. And that just became an, an outlet to just talk about that one idea. And that was the other real big lesson that I learned over time too, is that uh, I don't know, like I, I wanted to make a comic and then for some reason I was just like, okay, it's the comic that needs to do everything I've ever thought. Like every cool idea, every research I've ever had, like it's all going to get somehow worked into this comic and I, <laughs> never for a second. Cause if you were like, dude, just write like two or three comics. It was like, do you know how much work, Right. Just working on one comic is and now you're saying do like three or four that's insane i mean like fast forward both of us now have got you know yeah. multiple under our belt and it is crazy <laughs> exactly. it is a lot of work yeah that's that's always been the rookie mistake for uh writers who start out writing comics they want to cram everything because i'm guilty of it too where the first comic book i ever like for instance the reset protocol was essentially my first completed story but the first drafts, the first few drafts were just everything crammed into this, into this, this story here. And I had it all a, needs to be there. It's all important. Nothing. Can exactly. Get done. Exactly. Yeah. But then you have to, then you learn about pacing. You learn about, okay, you, you can't introduce everything because you're going to bog down the reader. You got to slowly introduce it, that kind of stuff. So then the few other edits, I had to take away a bunch of chunks. And then finally I got the story that I, that I essentially was happy with i wasn't essentially i wasn't essentially what i wanted <laughs> but at least i was happy with it in the end which is important it, it's rough out there for for writers man especially when it turns into like this visual medium because it gets like every time you introduce another medium it gets more and more niche until yes you have to like actively promote it and get it out there so I don't want to. I don't want to stray too far. I've got a little segment here, and then we're not going to skip it. We never do. It's called PCP. 
And uh, I'll just play the intro and then I'll explain the rule. Hey, conspiracy buffs, I double dare you to take some PCP, the Paranormal Conspiracy Probe. On your marks, get set, and go! All right, everyone likes this segment. It's the best segment. It's everyone's favorite. If you don't know the rules, I'm just going to ask you a whole bunch of different topics and you're just going to rate them from zero to 10. So zero meaning you don't believe it at all and 10 meaning that you absolutely believe it. And then five, if you want to be a fence sitter. And then if you want to like explain your your choices and like justify it, we'll save that for later. But I just want to get like some of the numbers out of you. All right. All right. So we'll start out on Bigfoot. Where are you at on Bigfoot zero to 10? <sighs> Man, I would say, I would say seven. What about giants? Seven. Like giant people? I'm going to say 10. What about giant people today in 2024? Uh, mm. Like alive? Are you talking about alive? Not not bones? Yeah, or today, yeah. Not just like bones or like you know stored somewhere. Like there's there's like a secret oh, giant. Gosh, man, you know what? I'm gonna or... say nine. I'm gonna say nine. And the reason why why I say nine is because there's been I don't, I'm sure you've seen footage and cell phone footage of like supposed giants on top of these hills. Like I saw one uh, a guy in Mexico who was driving his truck and he saw it and he stopped and he started recording this. But it looked like a giant, like a nine foot tall giant doing push ups or like walking around back and forth on top of this mountain. And of course, you have that TikToker from, uh, I think it was from Washington, I believe, who, who, uh, disappeared. I don't know if you heard about that guy. Well, this sounds in line with like the missing 411, which is a long list of people that go missing right. that are related to this. Yeah. Now, this one was a TikToker who recorded a, a giant walking around atop of a, a snowy mountain this time around. And he decided to go up there. And then when he went up there to get a closer look, there was these black cars, <laughs> unmarked cars who told him to turn around. And so he did, but then they started following him. And then next thing you know, he's, he like disappeared. So I was like, okay, well there's something going on. Something fishy is going on. Uh, what about Chupacabras? Uh, I want to say, Probably a six for that one. Okay, a little little downgrade from Bigfoot. Yeah, because Bigfoot at least there's some compelling footage of, of people capturing him or it. Um, but Chupacabras, I mean, not really much. So that's why I'm like, oh, maybe six. Maybe it was like a, a government experiment animal that escaped the, the laboratory and wasn't making the rounds. Who knows? What about a uh, talking snake from the Bible? Talking snake from the Bible. Is that you talking about the the snake from Eve? The Adam and the Garden yeah. Do you Eve? think? Do you think in a literal sense that there was a point in time when, like, a snake was actually inhabited by some other spirit and could talk to a human? Yeah, I'm gonna say ten on that one. So, like, a literal interpretation of Garden of Eden. I I believe so. I mean, hey, like the, the way we interpret the Bible, it's People do it literal, but I mean, there's some things I I personally believe are literal and there's some things that are a little bit more symbolic, but you know, then again, I'm not, I'm not completely religious. So, uh, what about reptilian aliens? Like specifically reptilians? <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's probably like a, a one, I would say. With the little gray dudes. The same one. Is there any alien that would rank higher than a one? Any alien? Um, Space mold? Yeah, I'm I'm in the personal belief that aliens and all those reptilians are, are demons that just look like reptilian aliens because we, the human mind can't really comprehend that idea, that concept. So I, okay, well, I, I'm demons. De demons zero to 10. Oh, 10. What about angels? 10 uh let's so here's this is another one that i go down this this route a little bit but let's say that uh a complete atheist right some like 13 year old just discovers the internet uh they first mm -hmm. you know they get around the nanny block or whatever's on it they're an atheist <laughs> 
but they find some article about, you know, Satan worship and you're like, Oh, this is interesting. And they go on Amazon and they just search for the top 10 commercially, like best selling five star rated books that are all like how to summon a demon, summoning demons for dummies. Oh, one one of <laughs> They go and they just buy like the top 10 and they read them all. And they, they do the things that are in these books. And let's assume that the book doesn't make you do anything illegal. You don't have to kill an animal. You don't have to torture anyone. But okay. it's all like, draw this symbol on the ground and recite these words. Right. And, you know, you've, you've probably seen some of this. So zero to ten on this 13-year-old atheist that, that sits <laughs> in their room and just orders books <laughs> from Amazon that are like direct, you know, like print on demand, go through a Xerox machine and get sent to their door zero to 10. And that person is capable of summing in a demon at some point. <sighs> oh, that's a good one. That's a real good one. Um, yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to say 10, 10. They're screwed. Uh, what about ghosts? Um, I'm going to say 10 because I experienced it personally myself as a kid. We'll, we'll get into that. Okay. Well, what about dinosaurs? Um, ooh, that's another good one. Yeah, I'm still I'm not completely convinced, honestly, about this the the dinosaur conspiracy that they're being fake. I'm I'm not entirely convinced yet because I haven't looked into it. So I'm gonna say ten for the dinosaurs. What about birds? What about birds? Are birds fake? <laughs> Have you not heard <laughs> I've never heard of uh, that. No. Thing. Oh yeah, oh, birds aren't really? real. Yeah, man, you're you're laughing, but this is a real thing. Oh, dude, I never heard of that. I'm laughing because I never heard of that. Yeah, really? bir- birds aren't real because they might actually just be surveillance devices, or there's a chance that a large number of birds that you do see aren't birds and they're just surveillance devices, but birds are real. And one of the reasons people bring up is that have you ever seen a baby pigeon? And if the answer is no, then where the no. hell do pigeons come from? I had never seen a BB pigeon. It might be a psyop. What about flat earth zero to 10? Flat earth, the firmament. That's a five for me. So you can go either way. I can go either way because, uh, you know, one of the, one of the main things that I've learned that I, I sp- had stuck with me ever since I read Plato was Socrates, you know, uh, I, well, I forgot the, the actual line of it, but um, the one thing I know for sure is that I don't know anything. And that's one of them. I was like, I've never been to, per- to space personally. And um, the moon landing is something that I don't really believe in either. Now you're reading, you're, you're jumping ahead. So let me, ask sorry, you sorry. The, the moon uh, but but yeah, five, thing. because um, I find it very suspicious that Von Braun on in his in his uh i guess not not tombstone but his plate in his in his uh, uh grave site does have the the biblical verse of the uh the firmament specifically so i i find that very interesting that he had he chose that or his family chose that for him but who knows yeah, shout Five. out to werner von braun one of the best disney stars uh ever <laughs> Pro- project paperclip mvp MVP. Yep. NASA, the creator of NASA. He got him. He, was, he was in like the first round draft pick. So, <laughs> so does your belief in flat earth and moon landing, are those linked somehow? Like if, for example, if, if you found conclusive evidence that you accepted that the moon landing was, I don't know, fake, completely fake. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that all of a sudden you're like more on board for flat earth or are you still out of five? And then vice versa. If, if there's, you know, like empirical proof that you're satisfied with that we did land on the moon. Does this now mean that flat earth is out the window? Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be the case. Um, I would have to, I would literally have to be going to space myself and see for myself whether or not what I look back is a round sphere as opposed to a firmament. People think flat like a coin, but a firmament is really like a flat bottom with the dome on top of it. And um, I mean, but yeah the the moon landing the reason why i questioned it was because of what what boggled my mind was the the phone call that richard nixon had 
with them, which was like, wait, how could how could he call them in real time in the in the sixties? When- that was a really long cord. <laughs> exactly right, a long cord, a long cord to the uh, to the moon. But uh, th- I mean, there's a lot of stuff I, I don't want to get into it now because I know we're running low on time. But uh, yeah, that would have to be the case. I would have to uh, see it for myself. But does that be- would that even count? Because I'm I'm this is one that I think about a lot, right? So let's say that yeah. you are going out into space and you can look out the window, right? So who built the spacecraft? Is the, is any of these scenarios where like you personally amass the money and resources and commission it and you're in the factory every day and like checking on it? Or <laughs> is this like you go and you, you know, hop on board and you give someone like, you know, you buy a ticket and you use their spacecraft, right? I, I, I would, I would pay a ticket. I would pay a ticket. Okay. So you're paying yeah. a ticket and they tell you, Hey, like once you're in this craft and it shoots out into outer space, like you're not allowed to go outside because you'll die, you know, like you'll, you'll suffocate immediately. Like you have to stay in this little craft. So the second they seal that door, how can you be sure you're not just on like a Disney world adventure? <laughs> and it's just like one of those 5d rides that does everything. And you look out the window and you see the you're earth. Right. Like, no, you're what, right. Cause, cause I really think that if you took the most staunch, you know, like flat earther that's like i have to see it from my eyes and you show it to them with their eyes they'll be like that's not you know you weren't showing me the real thing the <laughs> the porthole is actually a screen or right it's the the window's real but you're just like nasa's projecting a hologram so wherever i look right. they're like there i don't think there would ever be a way that anyone could like come off of that hill if that's if they've like dug their heels all the way in right yeah no you're right you're right um damn, those are also good very valid points too um but yeah i i i guess now now that you that you've mentioned that i will have to do it myself make create my own rocket ship that i go on myself or put ca- a bunch of cameras on it and send it to space and let it let it right, die but, in space but but even I got then my footage. Unless you've got more resources than the, you know, the international governments and NASA and Elon Musk and everyone else that's claims they've been out there first, unless you also have more resources than them, then you could also just be like, well, they've got a big, you know, hologram that's out on the top of the firmament dome. And now all the stuff you're doing, they've got inside spies and they're just projecting holograms. So every time you look <laughs> and you do something, it's just a hologram being project. You know what I mean? Like there's no, yeah. there's no end to that. And I guess the, the point, and I always bring up Rene Descartes now, uh, which is maybe my big trope, but like he didn't believe his own eyes because he thought that the optical nerve was just vibrating. And the, the logic behind that is if you ever gotten hit in the back of the head real hard and you just see like a white light is because like all your optic nerves just kind of like vibrated in it and you saw everything. It was like turning every pixel on the screen. You get a big white light and then it goes mm. away again. And with that mm. in mind, it was like, well, wait a minute. Does that mean mm. if like someone just like flicked my optic nerve, they could make me see a red car or a, a flat earth or a round earth? And the answer is yes. And then what he took away from that was that you can't trust your outside senses to tell you what the truth is about the world. You can't trust your smell, touch, sight, none of that. You can only trust logic and reason. And that was like he started over from scratch and it was like unlearn everything I've ever learned that relied on the senses and now just use pure ration and pure logic, which is not an easy thing to do. And he was probably a dick to be around. And, you know, uh, (laughs) he also died early because, yeah, we he has a weird backstory. He might have been taken out, but that I always come up with that one because if someone says they don't believe something because of like their their vision, like the, because of what they heard or what they saw, mm. something in me is like, well, then you'll never believe anything. You know what I mean? Like I can I can play the hologram 5D Disney you know ride on any any scenario that you want to put up that that says you're discounting or giving credit to something just based on your eyes. Uh, and especially now it's like, I guess it's like the, the Neo and the matrix argument, right? Like, how do you even know that those are your eyes? Right. Hmm. So where, well, where are you out on, you said ghost, you were at a 10 because you've yeah. seen one before. I want to, I like hearing ghost stories. Well, this happened when I was, uh, probably like six, seven years old. Um, my family lived in this house 
a, it was a small house, smaller house. And before we moved out of that one to a bigger house, um, I, I'm convinced now that that, that house was haunted. Um, but there were two major instances that happened in the house when I was, uh, when I, when I lived there, my brother and I used to share a bed and the, well, I'll, I'll start with the first instance. My brother and I used to share a bed, sleep in the bed. And he had a bad habit of annoying the crap out of me after I fell asleep. He would like throw things, throw the toy at me, try to get me to stay up with him. And so, um, one night, uh, I slept on my, with my jeans, with my jeans on, uh, which annoyed my mom tremendously, but I didn't care. And I could feel someone tugging the back belt buckle loop. Right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm being shaken awake and I'm thinking it's my brother. I'm thinking he's trying to wake, get me, get up. So I'm, you know, laying on my stomach and without opening my eyes, I, you know, you know, Hey, Ray, like, stop, stop. Right. And it stopped for a second. I tried to go back to sleep and I started doing it again. Started started yanking at me again and i was like ray stop and then it stopped again and tried to go back to sleep but the third time it actually grabbed the the loop and it started lifting me up so in my head i'm thinking he's 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 standing over me and he has a stick or something and he's lifting me up right with the stick because i because i could feel my my uh my back going up right it's going up like it's i'm being lifted and so i just go for the straight up like i'm gonna elbow this guy and i'm gonna elbow him good right so i swing a long swing back whoops long swing back and you just hit him again <laughs> yeah I, <laughs> this this the uh, pole here behind me so i swing all the way back to get him a good a good hit and i hit nothing and then i fall back to the bed and this time i get oh, i get i Pound up and turn around, and my brother is dead asleep. And I'm thinking, okay, he's faking. So I, I go next to him and I'm like, you know, doing this whole thing, and he's dead asleep, dead asleep. And at that point, I'm like, what the? F-? And I just grab my my blanket and I just <laughs> I just covered myself with the blanket and fell back asleep like that. The second instance that happened was. uh Early in the morning, it probably happened like around four or five because I do remember the blue haze of the morning when the sun's about to rise. When I same when I house got up because was that same house, same house, same house. And what woke me up was a tapping noise. I kept hearing a tapping noise, and so I'm thinking, okay, it's probably a tree outside. You know, tapping you know, the branch, tapping the window. It might be a windy morning. I look out the window, no wind but I keep hearing this tappy noise, it's, you know, like a slow tappy noise. And I'm half asleep, half awake and looking around. And then I see my sister's doll's head bouncing by itself towards me. <laughs> and uh, this, this instance, I, I, I could probably leave it up to like, maybe I was, I was dreaming it because I was half asleep, half awake. Maybe I was, maybe I dreamt it. But the first instance, I I know for sure. I, I was like, no, that something was pulling me up. But the the, the second one, I, I still to this day, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure. But then later that same day, Thomas, I kid you not, my friends come over. Hey, we're gonna play baseball at the park. You want to come with us? Because the park was like literally down the block, so it wasn't that far from me. So I was like, yeah, let me go get my glove, right? So I run back in, and I go under my bed, and I. I, <laughs> I kid you not, Thomas, that doll's head was next to my glove. And I feel I like you're probably messing with you. Like I'm really getting strong vibes here. I, I mean, I, I don't know, man. Like, uh, again, he was asleep when I looked over. He was asleep and I just went back to sleep because like, you know what? Uh, no, nah, I'm just going to I'm just going to go back to sleep. The third instance, <clears throat> it wasn't so much. Uh, I saw anything. It was what happened. So I was on the floor playing with my He-Man action figures. I had Skeletor and He-Man. I was, you know, fighting them together. So you're 20 here? No, <laughs> I was the same age. <laughs> uh, my brother's taking a nap in the couch. The TV's on. My mom's in the kitchen cooking. And I'm right there. You know, I'll destroy you, He-Man, right? And all that stuff. And my brother starts crying. 
And I look over and he's crying. Like he's like bawling. And I'm thinking, oh, he has a night. He's having a nightmare. And my mom, you know, being, you know, a mom was like, what are you doing to your brother? <laughs> You're like, what are you doing to him? I'm like, I'm not doing anything to him. And she, she peeks her head out to the, from the kitchen and she sees that I'm on the floor playing with my action figures and my brother's, you know, crying on the couch. So she starts to walk over to, you know, find out if he's okay. And halfway when she gets to the couch, dude, the fucking couch, excuse me, the couch goes up in flames. Like it combusts into flames. So my brother's crying, crying and crying and crying. Like, uh, as like, it felt, it, it, it sounded like someone like hurt him. That's why my mom's like, what are you doing to your brother? Cause that's what she thought was happening. And so when she, when she walked over and the, the freaking couch just caught fire and my mom freaked out, grabbed my brother, grabbed me. Thankfully, my older brother was outside. He came in with the hose because he heard what was going on. He came in with the hose and put the, the couch out. And of course, my dad got home. He thinks he's pissed because he thinks we we're playing with matches. And my mom was like, they weren't playing with matches. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking he got a hold of like a lighter or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and my dad, you know, of course he was like, no, no, they were playing with matches. I know it. I know it. Cause my dad used to smoke in the house back. It was like in the eighties. So it was still not, you know, taboo to smoke inside the house. And, and I, I told my dad, like, no, dad, I wasn't playing with, with your matches. And Ray was asleep. My mom was like, yeah, he was asleep. Ray was asleep in the, in the couch, on the couch. He was not playing with matches. I saw him. He was sleeping, crying because he was having a nightmare. And so another unexplained thing, man, I don't know what happened so he, there. So he was completely asleep and starts crying like, like sleep crying. Yeah. Yeah. And then sleep the couch crying. lights on fire. Dude, the, I, what, so, I swear. So was there ever like, did, did you guys ever find like a cord that was connected? Was there any like resolution I, on what actually started the fire? No, I, I don't. Maybe there was and they never told me. Um, but I don't remember, I don't, I don't recall a lamp being next to that couch. They were probably closer to the wall. If I remember I, it, but it was so long ago, man. I, I don't, I don't remember exactly what was, what was it is while the timing is pretty wild. Like the moment that your brother starts crying and your mom goes in to check on him, it just like sets on fire. Dude, it was wild. Over. It was wild. I, and, and I, I was like. It, it's always it's like seared in my in my memory uh my memory bank it's just like it was like how did, how how is that even possible like he was asleep he wasn't playing with matches or or lighter or anything he was literally asleep on the couch so well, it, that, it was weird it was wild that reminds that, i think me that house was, I, was haunted well one of my first like supernatural conspiracy theory things that i really got big into was the spontaneous combustion where people would just like light on fire in the middle of their right. car or the middle of their right. apartment which doesn't really have like there's almost no reports of that anymore but this sounds like that man this sounds like one of those like like unsolved mystery paranormal yeah and, and he didn't my brother didn't catch fire it, it caught fire on the couch which was weird which was like, I just don't understand. But, and, and now here's another thing to, to add to this, to this uh, saga of that house. Fast forward, you know, I'm 30 years old and my dad and I, my, my biological dad, cause I, I was raised by my stepfather and, um, and my mom, but my biological dad, um, I told him the story. Cause you know, we were just talking and we were talking about experiences of, of supernatural experiences. And he told me he shared his supernatural experiences. And then I shared with him th this story I just told you and he stayed quiet. And he's like, are you talking about that house on, on, Ch on chestnut street? The one that, that you lived in when you were a boy. Right. And I was like, yeah, that house. And I was like, why? And he's like, something happened to me in that house. When I came to to pick you up one day uh, to take you with me, and I was like, "Well, well what happened?" He's like, "Well, uh, I came I came over, and you were getting ready, and I was sitting in the couch, and your mom was in the kitchen doing her thing, and this overwhelming sense of of uh, what do you call it drowsiness came. He's like, came over me. It just got really drowsy and really sleepy and tired." Uh, it, it's, uh, it was on that brown couch and I was like oh yeah the, the, the same couch that caught fire and he's like I just can't I just 
like I don't know what happened. It was like it was like as if I drank a whole bottle of NyQuil and I was ready. My body was ready to shut down. So I just laid back, like laid back, closed my eyes for a second because you were still getting ready. So I was like, oh, I'll just close my eyes for a minute. Maybe I was retired because I, I had worked night, a midnight shift the day before, and fell asleep. And the next thing I know, I hear, "Okay, I'm ready," and I get up, but I'm awake, but I can't move. I'm paralyzed which is what reminded me of sleep paralysis. And so he's like, I'm, I'm trying to get up because I heard you say I'm ready and I, and I'm trying to get up and I can't, I can't, I'm trying to move and I'm looking around and I see this old lady right here in my nose, looking at my eyes. Like she, he said it was an old lady looking at me, right? Like right here. And I'm trying to move because I don't know who she is. I don't know if she's a crazy lady who came in the house and I'm trying to like, move her out of the way. And she's following me as I'm trying to like, you know, get, get up. And then next thing I know I'm, sh- I'm being shaken and I don't know. And I think it's this woman shaking me and I'm trying to fight her off and I can't move. And then eventually I finally woke up and it was your mom waking me up going, Hey, what's going on with you? Like what? <laughs> like your eyes were at the back of your head. Are you okay? Like, are you all right? And he, he was just like, I need to step outside the house. <laughs> I need to go outside. <laughs> so tell, tell Julio, tell, tell Julio that uh, I'll, I'm ready for him when, when, um, when he's ready. And he, and he's like, I got out, I got out of the house because I had no idea what the hell was that. I had never experienced anything like that. And I left the house and I waited for you outside. I was like, wow. Was it the house or was it the couch? Who knows, dude? Who knows? I mean, did, after point. the couch set on fire, I assume the couch got thrown out. Yeah. Yeah. So then did, was there any other experiences after the couch was out of the house or did that end it? <laughs> No, we moved out not long after. So I don't know if, <laughs> honestly, man, I don't know if my mom told my my stepdad, we need to get the hell out of here because <laughs> something's going on in this house. And because literally like maybe about two or three months later, we moved out to our, our bigger house. I kind of like the idea of a haunted couch more than a haunted house. Yeah. I mean, for all we know, yeah, it could have been the couch. Maybe we inherited the couch. I have no idea. It was, it was so long ago. I don't know where it came from but yeah th- that was my ghost experience and there, ever since then that's when i was like okay yeah i don't care what anyone says <laughs> hauntings are real like i don't know i can't explain it i don't know what they are i don't know what purpose they serve but it, they're real they exist so i don't care what anyone says <laughs> i like that man and I'm, I'm a sucker for ghost stories so i'm kind of glad that we got to to wrap up on a ghost story or yeah. even like three but again then the, the couch getting set on fire and the link to your dad having like yeah. this weird experience with the that, couch and sleep paralysis yeah I mean, man haunted couch that man was, I, i'm saying it right now i think you had a haunted couch <laughs> that should be that should be the next issue of one of your books <laughs> So um, I'm going to pull up your page again. This is the Reset Protocol Kickstarter. It's running for the next 17 days. It ends on March 17th. So I'll make sure that this gets out before the 17th um, so that people have got a chance to go in here and back this. That's impressive. Already like 58 backers. That's a decent number of people that are backing this already. It really is. So I'm happy. How they recommend it. Go back to Reset Protocol. Uh, and then again, tell people where to find you again, Julius. Uh, yeah, you can find me on uh, X, uh, a lucid comic and uh, Instagram, um, a lucid PRD. And you can follow me on YouTube. Um, Julius Freeman comics. Um, I, I just talk about comics. I really don't talk about anything else other than that. Um, even though I would like to talk about other stuff like conspiracies and whatnot, but, uh, I, I want to keep it separated. So I'm, I might create another channel where I just talk about all the conspiracies that I've learned over the years, because I do have a lot of uh, books here that I, w- I would like to make videos on. But uh, for now, it's just comics. And, um, you know, thank you for having me, Tom, on your show and uh, uh, being part of this, uh, the stream and being able to share my personal ghost stories with you. <laughs> yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for the amazing work and time samplers. I, I hope to bring it back up at some point again. I still have more that I want to tell through that series. It's, it's just yeah, a lot dude. of work, man. It's a lot of work yeah, to keep really doing all is. these different stories, but it's, it'll be in the cards. So um, you'll see Julius Freeman on another paranoid American 
title at some point right. in the future for sure yeah um so <laughs> thanks again man i'll uh i'll wrap this up let's see what i want to play here oh i've got a new series uh four different issues i don't know why i'm i'm an insane person but four different issues are already done and completed and now i'm gonna release the series i didn't release it when the first one was out i waited for all four just because they all were kind of like getting worked at the exact same time but ah, okay. it's called illuminati and it basically it's uh like all the different conspiracy stories that we talk about normally plus some like naughty little you know titties and stuff Eyes wide shut, a surreal ball, rough mansion, creepy hall behind every door a cloaked body don't you know this is illuminati if we put the naughty in the Are you ready to reveal all there is to see? Esoteric secrets revealed in all of their glory. The Illuminati series from Paranoid American. Putting the naughty in Illuminati. More details at paranoidamerican.com.